at the wonder of the human nervous system. This is a, a very good example of intelligent design because any wiring system needs to be planned from the beginning. If you take, for example, this building, if you were to look above these uh, boards here, you'd find a lot of wiring uh, for this building. You can't add wiring at the last minute. It has to be planned from the beginning because the wiring reaches every part of the building. And the same is true of the human body. You can't just add or evolve uh, all the nerves and wiring in the body. It has to be planned from uh, the beginning, as I, as I will show. So I just want to mention the reason, one of the reasons for my interest in this subject is I have done research on artificial muscles. I had a PhD student, O. Arami. We published three papers from our work. We designed the silicon-based dielectric elastomer uh, muscles. Uh, the conclusion of our work, uh, by the way, one of these was prize-winning work. The second paper you can see here, Smart Materials and Structures, a top journal in the area. We had a prize for our work. But one of the, one of the lessons we learnt is that even the best engineering artificial muscle is so inferior to human or animal uh, muscle. Our muscles had something like a tenth of the strength. They were very bulky, very clumsy, they couldn't last very long. And so this really fired my appreciation uh, for how brilliantly human muscle is designed. This is one of uh, my interests and I will focus on movement of the nervous system. I'm also interested in this because I've helped to wire a spacecraft. One of the spacecraft I helped to design is the METOP meteorological satellite which is about the size of this room and it was very difficult to wire that so I can appreciate the wiring of the human body. So what are the functions of the nervous system? Well one of them is to perceive sensory information like sight, sounds and touch. So for example if a, a fly lands on your arm uh, your arm is able to detect that. In fact, whatever part of your body a fly lands on, you can detect it because your skin has millions of sensors to sense the sense of touch. Then secondly, a second function of the nervous system is to process sensory information. And this is often not fully appreciated. It's an incredible thing because Every second, your brain is receiving millions of pieces of information. Millions of pieces of information. And if a fly lands on your arm, <clears throat> in a split second, your brain says, well, I've got a million pieces of information. I think you need to know about the fly that's just landed on your arm. And your brain tells you a fly has just landed on your arm. Even though you can feel your clothes, if you think about it, your brain says, well, ignore all those kind of feelings. I think you're interested in, in the fly. And it happens in a split second. And that's something the engineers just marvel at. How is the brain just able to filter that information to know what is important? Even if the fly lands on a part of your body you can't see, and your brain tells you which part of the body that the fly has landed on, it's actually an incredible thing. Then thirdly, the brain can send commands. It can send commands to the muscles. It can also send commands to glands to release enzymes or hormones. In this case, your brain might say, well, that fly doesn't look very uh, good. Perhaps you should move your arm and pick off that fly off of your arm. So they're the three functions of the nervous system to perceive uh, senses, to process information, and then to send commands. It all looks straightforward, but it's incredibly complicated. It's a very difficult engineering task to solve. So, uh, just to explain the two main parts of the nervous system. First of all, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So, uh, your brain has to send out signals in red, the motor signals, but in, into the brain come the sensor signals. 
Now, it's very difficult to funnel millions of nerve signals through the spinal cord. The spinal cord is about 12 millimeters diameter. Uh, as an engineer, I've had to funnel a lot of wires into a cable harness, but not millions of wires into a cable just 12 millimeters diameter. That is an astonishing feat. If you look on a spacecraft, you'll see a big computer like this, and you'll see hundreds of sensor wires going into the computer. You'll see hundreds of motor wires coming out of the computer. But just think, that's what's happening to your brain, except your brain is far more powerful than any computer on a spacecraft or a car or an aeroplane. But then there's the peripheral nervous system. And from your brain, your nerve pathways reach every part of your body. It's an incredible design to be able to do that. This is a, a picture of the METOP satellite that I mentioned. It's a meteorological weather satellite. I designed the uh, solar array deployment system as well as doing most of the wiring on that spacecraft, 30 kilometers of wiring. It's very difficult to reach every part of a spacecraft with the wires. I remember going up to the chief designer of the structures on the spacecraft and I said, well, you've got a beam going from one end to the other on your spacecraft. Do you mind if I drill a hole right in the middle to put my main cable harness through? And he said, well, I, I do mind if you do that because all my calculations I'll have to completely redo. So no, please don't put a hole in my structure. But I said, well, I'm sorry, I have to because I have to reach the other part of the spacecraft. Sorry, sir, can we use that one? Because sorry. I think, I think this one's just giving a little bit of high okay. pitch. So we'll just Shall I do that? Off yeah, yeah. This one. That's right. Okay, where is that one? That's fine. Just, just use that. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so, so just explaining, this is the Meetop uh, spacecraft. And if you are a harness uh, engineer or the wiring, engineer, you can become a very unpopular person because you have to go through structures, you have to go through thermal blankets and everyone has to accommodate the wiring to get those wires to every instrument. Uh, there are thermal heaters all over the spacecraft so those wires have to reach every part and it's a really difficult thing to do and when I look at the human body I think well that's remarkable that on your skin you have millions of sensors. Every square millimetre of your skin has sensors. If you don't believe me, poke a pin in your skin all over your body and you won't find one part of your body where it doesn't hurt to put a needle into your skin. But how does the human body get nerve endings and pathways from the brain to every part of the skin? It's, it's an incredible uh, thing and if you've design the wiring on a spacecraft, you can really appreciate that is a difficult thing. Let me just uh, mention the challenge of standing and the challenge of running uh, because I've been involved in uh, designing robots in a, in, a, in a robotic laboratory and it is really hard to try to make a robot do what humans can do. So let's look at the challenge. If you're standing on two legs, that's fairly straightforward because you have to put your center of gravity through a kind of trapezium uh, you can see in the dotted line. You put the center of gravity there between those points. But if you're standing on one leg, which I'm sure most of us can do, I'm doing it now, that's quite difficult because you're putting your center of gravity through three points on the foot. Our feet are wonderfully designed. They have this perfect three-point contact with the ground. I have a lecture on that, but those are the three points. So when you're standing on one leg, which humans can do really well, you're having to put your center of gravity just through those three points. So that's a difficult thing to do. But what is really, really, really difficult is the next bit, because when you're running, your centre of gravity is then moving forward. And if you want to run in a straight line, you have to put that centre of gravity through those little points on your feet. This is one of the reasons why 
our femur bones point inwards at the knees so that when we're running the center of gravity is under or is above the feet on the ground. If you want to change direction then you put the center of gravity slightly outside of the foot uh, in order to make that change of direction. So running is what engineers call an, an inherently unstable activity because you're continually having to re-stabilize yourself um, or or deliberately change uh, direction. So running is a really, really hard thing to do. So how come we are so good at running? Uh, by the way, if anyone wants to go for a run tomorrow morning, you can meet me for a 10 kilometer run. I've already got it planned uh, out there somewhere. What is the challenge of running on rough ground? I love cross country. When I was at university, I was captain of the cross country club for two years running. It's a great thrill, sprinting along trails, sprinting through woods. But what is incredible is you could be running through woods at say 12 miles an hour, really fast. It feels like sprinting. You're looking ahead at the runner ahead and your foot hits a tree root. And in a split second, the human body can not only detect that, but counteract that. And instead of falling flat on your face, you can actually in a split second counter that and not fall over. It's the most uh, incredible thing. In order to run, you need precise adjustment of hundreds of muscles. And you also need the position and velocity feedback of those muscles. So your muscles have what are called proprioceptors. You have uh, position sensors and velocity sensors, a very engineering solution. Uh, on each of your muscles, you have these position and velocity sensors and your brain processes that information and helps you to run. To build a robot that could be a cross-country runner is far, far harder than putting a man on the moon. Putting a man on the moon is a piece of cake. It's, it's, it's easy to put a man on the moon. To create a man that could cross-country run is just so hard. It may never ever be achieved. It's really hard. I'll just show you some pictures from top engineering laboratories because engineering laboratories have tried to produce walking, running robots. Well, here are a few pictures. These are common pictures. You, you tend to see pictures of the robots that work, not the robots that don't work. And these robots are walking and running on flat tarmac uh, without any tree roots, not cross-country running. It's a really difficult thing to do. But you look at the human body, at what the human body can do, and it is just truly astounding. There is just no comparison between the best robots and, and what the human body can do. <clears throat> um, obviously, these are very trained athletes, <coughs> but all of us can do very, very skillful tasks. So, in this part of the talk, I'll give some of the performance uh, aspects of the human nervous system to put things in perspective. Okay, wires, motors and sensors. On a spacecraft, on the spacecraft I designed, um, I did about 30 kilometers of wiring. That's a lot of wiring. It took a long time. On a humanoid robot, it's about half a kilometer of wiring. Well, how does this compare with the human body. How, how much wiring do you think is in the human body? Well, the answer is 150,000 kilometers. That just puts things into perspective. It's quite a difference, isn't it? That gives you um, an idea of the difference. In the human body, we have 500,000 motors. Why do I say that? Well, we have 700 muscles, but each muscle has sometimes hundreds of motor units. So for example, in your bicep, if you're picking up something using your biceps, you could pick up something light 
or heavy. And the reason it's easy to vary that strength is that the bicep isn't one muscle, it's made up of hundreds of motor units. And it's even more clever than that because the motor units vary in size, some are small, some are big. So you can apply very tiny forces with your muscle because of these individual uh, muscle units. And the human body has millions of sensors, so, so much more than with engineering systems. So this gives you an idea of the scale of complexity of the human body, far in excess of engineering systems. Well, that's the wires and motors. Well, now we just to give you an example of the sensitivity of the human nervous system. Now here is a, a tiny section of skin. So you can see there are lots of sensors in the skin. This is just like a pubic millimeter and just a tiny amount of skin. You can see the sensors packed in there. But just look at the human hair on the right hand side. At the bottom of that hair, you can see some nerve endings. When a fly lands on one hair on your skin, the hair bends and those nerves at the bottom are stimulated. So you could have the tiniest fly land on your skin and it touches a hair and then that hair will detect that and your brain will know exactly what part of the body that fly has landed on. Most of our hairs also have an individual muscle so that hair can become erect if you're cold and your hair stand on end or through an emotional response your hair stand on end that's because there's a little muscle there. Engineers cannot make a single hair like the hair on the human body. Isn't it interesting how the Lord said he's numbered the hairs on her head? Well he's created hairs that are a marvel of design with their own muscle, their own lubrication gland and their own nerves. So the reason we're so good at detecting things on our skin that weigh a fraction of a gram is because of these hairs as well as the other sensors in the skin. Our skin is so sensitive it can feel a ridge of 13 nanometers, that's the reference uh, there, that's a ridge you couldn't see and yet our skin is so sensitive. That, that's the reason why surgeons can be so skillful and artists and engineers. This is another example of purposeful over-design. You could never explain that through a theory of evolution. That, sk that skill and sensitivity that humans have. Then we get on to muscle control, which I've talked a little bit about already. So we have around 700 muscles. We have around half a million motor units, because as I explained, the, the muscles break down into motor units. We also have around 50,000 of those proprioceptors. These are the sensors that sense the position and velocity of all of our muscles. When you lift something up, uh, not only do you use your biceps, but you also have the triceps because they're antagonistic pairs. The reason they work so smoothly is because those two muscles give feedback of position and velocity to the brain. The brain integrates that information and it means you have no backlash. You have very smooth, damped uh, motion. It's an incredible design. Robots find it very hard to hold an egg, to do delicate things uh, that humans can do. We have that fine control of our muscles. Then we come, I'll just give you an example of the eye. This is one of my favorite examples of the human body. Now, when you look at that iris, what's in your mind? You think, uh, okay, this person has blue eyes. Uh, this iris is blue. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a nice blue eyed uh, eye. Well, I've, I've picked blue eyes deliberately because a blue eye is transparent. You have scattering of light to create blue. Now when I look at that, I'm not looking at a blue eye, I'm looking at dozens and dozens of muscles. Because those fine strands that you're looking at in this picture, each one is an individual muscle and a precision 
muscle, a muscle about 0.1 millimeter in diameter. Why is the iris of the eye full of muscles that happen to look beautiful as well? God's a great designer, he can create aesthetics and function at the same time. Well, in the middle of your iris, just around the pupil, you have what's called the sphincter muscles. They reduce pupil size in bright light. So on the inner ring, you can see a tiny set of tiny muscles. On the outside, you've got the iris dilator muscles. So they open the pupil in dark light. An engineer could never, ever design a camera with this kind of precision engineering. Uh, so accurate, so efficient, so compact. So you have these two sets of muscles, one to close the pupil, one to open uh, the pupil. And remember, all of those muscles have nerve endings and they're all going through your eye in order to open and close the pupil. So we look at eyes and we look at the beauty of the eye, but behind that is incredible engineering. Now we heard a little bit about this earlier, the cochlea, but th this is also showing the three semicircular canals that give you angular acceleration. When you're doing cross-country running, you need to know your orientation and balance, not just the local feedback on the muscles, but you also have um, not just the three semicircular canals, you also have the urticle and the vestibule, sorry, the, the, the saccule that give you linear acceleration. So your, your body has a huge amount of information, linear and rotational acceleration, uh, so your brain can process that to know uh, what you're doing and to help you balance and move. And how about computing uh, power? You, you hear about these uh, mega computers, these supercomputers. On the left uh, is the Summit computer, one of the most recent biggest supercomputers. And uh, it's a very big computer. It would probably fill this uh, room. The power needed to run that supercomputer is about 13 million watts. It can do 0.2 billion billion calculations per second. Well, how does that compare with the human brain? The human brain is one thousandth the volume of that supercomputer. The human brain is about one uh, litre. Notice that the human brain only needs 20 watts of power, something like a millionth of that super computer. That's a bit more efficient, uh, isn't it? Uh, so here you can see this summary table. Uh, you can see that the human brain can do a billion billion calculations per second. That's greater than one of the most recent supercomputers by IBM. Uh, and yet the human brain is, is so compact, so brilliantly designed. So Yes, on the one hand, you can give credit to the supercomputers, they're very powerful, uh, very useful, but in comparison to the human brain, you know, these supercomputers need a million times more energy to run than the human brain. Engineers would love to learn the secrets and lessons of the human brain in order to run computers more efficiently. So here we see this interesting comparison, just to uh, illustrate how great the nervous system is. But then in the second main part, uh, I just want to go over some of the architecture of the human nervous system. And uh, so first of all, the multifunctioning vertebral column. Uh, the, the vertebral column uh, had these vertebrae, they're a little bit like cups stacked on top of each other. Uh, a wonderfully flexible system. But it's a very multifunctioning system. It protects the spinal cord. It gives even spacing of nerve exits. It's a structural support for the body. Uh, you have cushioning of joints and you even have muscle attachments uh, as well. Uh, a very much an irreducibly complex system that has to be planned from the beginning. 
as I was mentioning before, it's incredible how the brain funnels uh, millions of nerve pathways into a spinal cord that's just over two centimetres in diameter. That's an in, just an incredible feat of engineering. What is interesting is that if you look at the root nerves that come out of the spinal cord, they're so big they can't come directly out. So you have these, you can see the bundles uh, of separate bundles, the uh, red ones are for the command bundles, commands going to the muscles. The blue ones are the sensor bundles going back in. On the left you can see an engineering cable. When I look at the human uh, sp spinal column, I see what looks like engineering cables going in with bundles. It's a very deliberate, precise system. What really fascinates me about these nerve bundles is that when the nerve root first comes out you have a separation of the sensor signals in blue and the motor signals in red because in your brain you have a separate area for the motor cortex and a separate area for the sensory cortex. But when nerves go to different parts of your body you actually need them mixed because when a nerve goes into your muscle you need both the uh, muscle commands and you also need the sensors. Incredibly what happens is near the root of these root nerves, going in one direction you have separate separation between the motor signals and the sensory signals but then they become mixed and you're mixing hundreds of thousands of different nerve pathways. From an engineer I think how is that possible? to do that they're separated and then they're mixed together. So you have this very precise uh, ordered engineering. Fifthly you have nerve branching. I mentioned before 150,000 kilometers of nerves in your body. How do they reach every part of your body? Well you have this branching system. You have the main nerve branches coming from the spinal cord then they break branch down into smaller branches then they go into smaller branches and earlier I showed you that cross section of skin where you had the tiny tiny nerve endings and so this branching system has to reach uh, millions of different places across the body. You can't even conceive in your head how that uh, is possible. As an engineer if you design a big building like this you have to branch different services like the water supply system, the electricity system. You have hundreds of uh, engineering drawings that show how you branch all the services to the different parts of the building. But that's so trivial compared to the human body. God has infinite understanding and you need that infinite understanding to design that kind of system. Uh, it's interesting to look at this picture on the left. You see uh, what a nerve looks like um, and the hierarchical design of that nerve with various sheaths. The nerve also has to have a blood supply uh, and just comparing that with an engineering cable you see the same kind of design and engineering except uh, in the human body. It's a far higher level of design. This is another area which I, I find really astounding. You look at a, a picture of the human body with those 700 muscles and there are muscles all over our bodies you can see on the right hand picture. But just think about this, every one of those 700 muscles, in fact every one of the motor units, the 500,000 motor units, they all need a nerve ending to give instructions to that muscle. They all need those, those sensors and those nerve endings have to be integrated inside that muscle. They don't just touch on the outside, they have to get inside those muscles. So that is showing a picture of the muscles but you have nerves integrated and weaved into every muscle. This is why the psalmist said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is unimaginable complexity. You just can't conceive of how intricate 
and brilliantly designed the human body is. And it's not just uh, our muscles for moving, but the organs uh, as well. The, the nerves have to be integrated with the organs like the heart. Thank you. And then there has to be integration with the skeleton as well. Earlier, I was giving you that uh, example of going up to the structural engineer on the spacecraft and saying, I'm sorry, but I have to put a hole through your main beam. But the same is true for the human body. This is showing part of the human skull. The big hole is the foramen magnum for where the spinal cord comes through the human skull. But in your skull, you have lots of little holes for wires to go through for your eyes and through other parts of your body. And in other bones as well, you have these holes, just like I was putting holes in structures on the spacecraft. Your bones in your, your pelvis and other bones, you have holes to put the wires through. And that needs planning from the beginning to get those wires in the same place. You can't just randomly add those wires later. It all has to be planned from the beginning. And then you have uh, wires that uh, move across moving joints. This is a, another problem I had on the Meetop uh, satellite in my solar array. I had moving joints and I had to have wires that could withstand that movement, but not as much movement as the human body. Uh, probably you can't move as much as this uh, lady here, but the wire, the, all the nerves in the body have to withstand a lifetime of those joints moving. And what is remarkable is you can lift to 80 or 90 and your nerves still cross your joint. You can still move your joints and your nerves are still working. A really interesting detail of the nervous system is what's called uh, brachial plexus, where you have this network of nerves. So you notice you have nerve endings coming out of the spinal column, but they don't stay separated. Very often adjacent nerves will network with each other, which is a, re a very robust uh, design feature because if you damage one nerve, you can often get a pathway to your spinal cord through a different nerve because the nerves are branched uh, together. This is the kind of thing engineers would like to copy to make more reliable systems. But this must be planned from the beginning. If you just evolve another nerve branch from the spinal column, it can't just become connected with another uh, nerve branch. This has to be designed from the beginning. And then if you look into the electrochemical signals, that's a whole other world of complexity to add to the other things that I've been talking about. I've mainly focused on the macro design, but the microscopic design is an incredible um, uh, aspect of design in the nervous system. So what is the evidence for intelligent uh, design? I've already mentioned irreducible complexity and the nervous system is certainly a very good example of irreducible complexity for the reasons that I mentioned. Things have to be planned from the beginning. And I've also mentioned purposeful overdesign. And I'll just give you a quotation from Professor Alice Roberts, uh, who's a humanist, and she said this, our enormous brains has been something which has taxed paleoanthropologists for decades and decades and I think still taxes everyone in the field. How and why have we developed these enormous brains? How have we done that? Well, she's quite right to say that. She can recognise and lots of scientists have recognised that our brains are just over-designed. Uh, you know, why are they so big? But you could say the same about the hands. Why can we play the violin and the piano? Our whole bodies have this, what I call, purposeful over-design. Exactly what you'd expect if God had created and designed us because he wants us to be talented beings who can enjoy uh, creating, designing, can enjoy music, but very difficult for the evolutionist to explain. God wants us to enjoy food. How does the evolutionist explain that we have all these taste buds, that we enjoy food? How can the evolutionist explain we can enjoy 
playing musical instruments as uh, King David did, but God wants us to enjoy those pleasures in life. Just to make a caveat, uh, of course, motor neuron disease is a, it, it, it is a terrible thing, but it's not a design flaw. It's one manifestation of the decay of creation. Engineering systems like computers, they decay, but they were still designed. And uh, as you've heard from other talks, that decay in nature is due to the fall of Adam and Eve. It wasn't something that God designed into the world. Just to answer one objection, this is the final point. You may have heard of the laryngeal nerve. This is a nerve that uh, serves the larynx. There are two of the laryngeal nerves. One goes at the top, it's the red one, but one loops down. You can see this purple ner uh, nerve loops right down. Now, Richard Dawkins has called this a ridiculous detour. Why should it do that? And Jerry Coyne has said this is one of nature's worst designs. One point I would make straight away is I've just been describing how the nervous system is utterly astounding. Engineers are in awe of it. So you have to be very careful to jump to a conclusion that there's a bad design in the nervous system. You've got to think, hang on, uh, the nervous system is an incredible design. One of the ways I would answer this, when I teach students how to do wiring, one of the first things I do in my first lecture is to say, wiring systems almost always have loops. If you looked at the wiring above this roof, you would see loops. There's various reasons you have loops, because when wires get stretched, uh, you need to have a loop in there. So when you see a loop like this loop, as an engineer, I think, well, that's exactly what I do when I design a wiring system. So Richard Dawkins and Jerry Coyne are unaware of a basic design feature of loops. This is part of uh, one of the spacecraft I designed, and I designed a double loop at the end of the robotic arm, uh, not dissimilar in size to the laryngeal nerve. So I had two loops. Why did I have loops? Uh, one reason is I needed to make intermediate connections to thermal sensors and proximity sensors. And it, it so happens that your laryngeal nerve uh, makes those intermediate connections to the trachea and to the esophagus. So I did on a spacecraft exactly what happens on the human laryngeal nerve. There are also assembly constraints on a spacecraft. You have to design a wiring system that can be physically made. And there are assembly reasons also for the human laryngeal nerve. So had Richard Dawkins have spoken to an engineer like myself, I could have explained there are actually good reasons for the laryngeal nerve to look the way it does, but he jumps in and assumes uh, that it's uh, not uh, a, a good design. So in summary, the human nervous system is a great example of irreducible complexity, but importantly, it also shows God's goodness. He wants us to enjoy creation through our senses, to enjoy that cross-country running, um, so easy to take our bodies for granted. Let's give God the praise for that. Thank you.